Hello, everyone, and welcome to the August edition of the Miller Johnson Benefits uh, Lunch Break webinar. Um, as always, you can use the uh, Q&A feature in the chat function to send us any questions that you have during the presentation, and the PowerPoint slide link will be available in the chat feature as well. So my name is, for those of you uh, who I haven't met yet, Brett Leaf Brower, and I'm an attorney in Miller Johnson's Employee Benefits Practice Group, and I'll be taking you through today's presentation. And before we get started, I will just let you know that we do have some additional upcoming webinars coming up next month on September 20th will be a webinar. Uh, not listed on this slide, Miller Johnson's Employment Law Seminar will also be happening in Grand Rapids in person uh, and also in Kalamazoo as well. And um, at the end of the year, uh, we usually get all of our employee benefits attorneys together uh, for a group presentation in December. If you have any upcoming topic ideas or anything that you'd like us to cover in one of these upcoming uh, webinars, please let us know in the post webinar survey or in the Q&A feature. So today we are going to briefly recap the group health plan implications of the end of the COVID-19 uh, emergency declarations, and we'll also learn more about uh, the IRS's newly issued guidance regarding high deductible health plan coverage of COVID-19 expenses and preventive care and the implications on health savings accounts um, of that new guidance. So let's start with some background and how we got to where we are today. So at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there were a uh, multiple emergency declarations that were issued. So on January 31st, 2020, the Department of Health and Human Services declared a public health emergency in response to COVID-19, and those had been renewed um, continuously up until this year. And on March 13th, 2020, uh, the president, President Trump, declared a national emergency under the Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief Act. Um, which was effective March 1st, 2020, and that also has continuously been renewed um, up until the current year. So why is this relevant? So the there are, is certain relief tied to both the presidentially declared national emergency as well as the HHS declared national emergency. Um, so with respect to the presidentially declared national emergency, there were extensions of various deadlines applicable to group health plans. Um, this includes uh, deadlines under COBRA, HIPAA, and, and claims and appeals deadlines. So more specifically, individuals um, would have extensions of time to elect COBRA continuation coverage. Individuals would have extended time to pay, pay their premiums for COBRA continuation coverage. Individuals would have extended time to elect enrollment following a HIPAA special enrollment event, uh, extended time to file claims, appeals, and requests for external review, and also extended time to provide COBRA election notices. With respect to the uh, HHS declared national emergency, there were various coverage mandates, um, including uh, mandatory coverage of COVID-19 testing, COVID-19 vaccines um, that were tied specifically to HHS's public health emergency declaration. So on January 30th of this year, the Biden administration announced its intent to end both the public health emergency and the national emergency on May 11th, 2023. And these emergencies have, in fact, ended on May 11th, 2023. And as many of you may know, um, Congress actually passed legislation in April uh, ending the, the presidentially declared national emergency. But as you'll see um, on the later slides, May 11th, 2023 remained uh, to be the key date uh, for all of the group health plan implications of the end of the national emergencies. So what are the group health plan implications of the end of these COVID-19 national emergencies? 
So beginning with the end of the presidentially declared national emergency, um, in general, now the tolling or suspension of various deadlines applicable to group health plans, again, those COBRA deadlines, HIPAA deadlines, claims and appeals deadlines, uh, those have now ended on July 10th of this year. So uh, again, going back to a little bit of background, so the Department of Labor has authority uh, to toll deadlines related to these group health plans uh, for a maximum of one year. So under previous guidance, the tolling of all of these deadlines would last until the earlier of one year. Uh, so for example, one year from an individual's deadline to elect COBRA or the duration of the COVID-19 outbreak period, which will now, which now has come to an end. So the outbreak period was effective March 1st, 2020, and lasted until the date that is 60 days after the date that the presidentially declared national emergency under the Stafford Act ends. And since the national emergency ended on May 11th, 2023, the outbreak period has now ended on July 10th of 2023. So it's important to keep in mind that the outbreak period only told or paused the time period used in determining those deadlines under COBRA and HIPAA and et cetera. So therefore the end of the outbreak period on July 10th, 2023 will not result in all of the deadlines paused during the outbreak period becoming due on July 11th, um, which would be the day after the outbreak period ended. Rather, employers will need to begin counting days beginning July 11th towards the determination of the deadline. So let's look at an example that uh, shows exactly how this works. So let's assume that a qualified beneficiary experiences a COBRA qualifying, qualifying event that causes a loss of coverage under the group health plan, uh, which is subject to ERISA on March 1st, 2023, due to a termination of employment. So typically that qualified beneficiary would have 60 days um, from the later of the date of the qualifying event or, or loss of coverage or receiving the COBRA election notice to elect COBRA. Um, however, uh, the DOL has extended this 60 day period during the outbreak period. Therefore that qualified beneficiary's deadline to elect COBRA as mentioned on the previous slide, will be extended until either the earlier of one year or the end of the outbreak period. So the one year deadline would be April 30th, 2024. But now that we know that the outbreak period has ended, that individual's uh, time to elect COBRA will start running on July 11th. So 60 days, um, if you count July 11th as the first day, uh, that individual's deadline to elect COBRA will now be September 8th, 2023. So moving over to the implications of the end of the HHS national emergency. So recall that both of the, all of these national emergencies ended on May 11th, 2023. So as of May 12th, 2023, the day after the public health emergency ends, Group health plans, including high deductible health plans, now have flexibility in determining if and how they are going to cover items and services related to COVID-19 testing. So now, um, as of May 12, 2023, there is no requirement to cover out-of-network services or the at-home COVID-19 tests. Uh, group health plans can now impose pre-authorization or other medical management techni techniques. And it's also now permissible to exclude coverage of COVID-19 testing. And as we'll discuss later in the presentation, uh, the coverage of COVID-19 testing by an HDHP, uh, a high deductible health plan, could lead to adverse consequences, uh, specifically health savings account ineligibility for participants in the high deductible health plan. So the Families First uh, Coronavirus Response Act, so the FFCRA and the CARES Act 
require non-grandfathered group health plans to cover COVID-19 vac vaccinations without participant cost sharing and on an accelerated basis. So we need to make a distinction here between COVID-19 testing and treatment um, and COVID-19 vaccinations. So with respect to vaccinations specifically, non-grandfathered group health plans will, will continue to be required to cover these um, on an in-network basis. So typically uh, these types of preventive services must be covered by non-grandfathered group health plans um, on a first dollar basis, beginning with the, the plan year that begins one year after the service received the re required recommendation by the government. However, with respect to these COVID-19 vaccinations, those must be covered within 15 business days uh, of receiving the re required recommendation. And to my recoll re recollection, there have been uh, four of these vaccines that have been approved. Um, I do not suspect that we will see many more of these vaccines um, coming out, uh, but, but if there are, um, this accelerated 15 business day coverage requirement will apply and this vaccination requirement is not tied to the ends uh, of these public health emergencies. So moving into IRS notice 2023-37. So this is the new, to got new guidance for HDHPs and HSAs uh, regarding the coverage of COVID-19 expenses. So this notice came out on June 23rd of this year. It was issued by both the Treasury Department uh, and IRS. And the main highlight of, of this notice is that for plan years ending after December 31st, 2024, high deductible health plans will no longer be permitted to provide coverage for COVID-19 testing and treatment under the high deductible health plan before the minimum deductible is met without jeopardizing a participant's health savings account eligibility. So keep in mind that there are two requirements for an individual to make contributions uh, to his or her health savings account or have contributions made on his behalf, for example, by an employer to his health savings account. Uh, the individual must be covered under a high deductible health plan and the individual must not have any other coverage that is not a high deductible health plan. So for example, providing coverage for an item or service that is not preventive care, such as COVID-19 testing and treatment before the minimum deductible has been met um, would constitute coverage that is not an HDHP and would make an individual ineligible for a health savings account. So there was some relief issued by the IRS uh, related to COVID-19 testing and treatment that was issued uh, in early 2020. So as, as I mentioned a moment ago, in general, if a plan sponsor voluntarily chooses to cover COVID-19 testing and treatment without participant cost sharing, this could jeopardize the health savings account eligibility of individuals enrolled in that HDHP. Uh, so the IRS addressed this in IRS Notice 2020-15, which provided that um, high deductible health plans may cover testing and treatment of COVID-19 before the deductibles are met without jeopardizing health savings account and eligibility for those individuals enrolled in the HDHP. And notably, the relief under notice IRS Notice 2020-15 uh, stated that it will last until further guidance is issued. So the ending of the national emergencies on May 11th, 2023, did not end this specific guidance regarding relief for high deductible health plans for the coverage of testing and treatment for COVID-19. So we received uh, further guidance in June of this year uh, related to IRS Notice 2020-15. Uh, and specifically, uh, the IRS and Treasury Department stated that the relief under Notice 2020-15 is no longer necessary 
uh, because the COVID-19 national emergencies and public em health emergencies have ended. So uh, accordingly, uh, the guidance that we received in June indicates that the HDHP HSA relief uh, will only apply with respect to plan years ending on or before December 31st, 2024. So for calendar year high deductible health plans, this means that the high deductible health plan must subject COVID-19 testing and treatment to the minimum HDHP deductible beginning with the 2025 plan year or, or 2025 calendar year. However, non-calendar year high deductible health plans will be required to make this change sooner. Um, that's because the 2024-2025 plan year will end after December 31st, 2024. So as an example, assume that a non-calendar year high deductible health plans plan year ends on August 31st. The relief under notice 2020-15 will only be applicable until the plan year that ends on August 31st, 2024. So the plan year that starts September 1st, 2024 uh, will have a plan year that ends after 2024. Um, as a result, the relief under 2020-15 will no longer be available for that 2024 uh, slash 2025 plan year. IRS uh, notice 2023-37 also uh, contained guidance related to the preventive care safe harbor and how that safe harbor um, applies to screening um, that is testing for COVID-19. And specifically, uh, the notice provided that the safe harbor does not include screening for COVID-19. So historically, uh, the IRS has released notices to clarify uh, what types of items and services would, would qualify for this preventive care safe harbor. And uh, notably, going back to IRS notice 2004-2023, um, that specific notice provided some specific examples of what constitutes permissible preventive care that a high deductible health plan may pay before the minimum deductible is met. And the appendix to that notice 2004-23 uh, contains a list of infections for which uh, screening services fall under the preventive care safe harbor. So that appendix um, indicates that screening services uh, for these types of infections listed here on the slide um, uh, would qualify for the preventive care safe harbor. And in the notice issued in June of this year, uh, the Treasury Department and IRS point out that screening for common and uh, episodic illnesses, uh, such as the, the common flu, are not on this list from the appendix. And Treasury and IRS reason that since COVID-19 is not like the infections listed in the appendix, uh, screening and testing for COVID-19 does not fall under the preventive care safe harbor. So that uh, preventive care safe harbor clarification is effective as of June 23rd of this year, which is the date that notice 2023-37 uh, was issued. However, uh, that clarification will not be relevant until the first plan year that ends after December 31st, 2024, um, because as we discussed, the high deductible health plan relief under notice 2020-15 will continue to be effective until that time. So before we move into the key takeaways uh, from today's presentation, I'd also like to mention that in IRS Notice 2023-37, the Treasury Department and IRS um, also clarified that items and services recommended with an A or B rating uh, by the United States Preventive Services Task Force, the USPSTF, 
um, will continue to be considered preventive care for um, high deductible health plan HSA purposes. So uh, accordingly, if, if COVID-19 testing uh, were to receive a recommendation of A or B from the USPSTF, that testing would then be considered um, as preventive care for high deductible health plan and health savings account purposes. So the key takeaways um, from this new guidance that we received, uh, as of May 12th, 2023, which was the day after the public health emergency ended, high deductible health plans now have flexibility to determine if and how to cover items and services related to COVID-19 testing. There's no requirement to cover out-of-network services or at-home tests. Uh, now, pre-authorization and medical management techniques can be imposed, um, and also coverage for COVID-19 testing can now be excluded. Um, however, if a high deductible health plan chooses to include uh, coverage of COVID-19 testing on a first dollar basis, um, th those high deductible health plans need to be aware that for plan years ending after December 31st, 2024, a high deductible health plan will no longer be permitted to provide coverage for that COVID-19 testing and treatment under the high deductible health plan before the minimum deductible is met uh, without jeopardizing a participant's health savings account eligibility. And with that, I am not seeing any uh, open questions. Uh, so I will conclude the presentation and uh, please join us next month for our next Benefits Lunch Break webinar series. Thank you.